Alrighty, Buckaroos. Today we have a legendary person with us, the one, the only, David Mulek. Welcome in, David. Can you explain to people? Well, thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. So yeah, could you give a brief introduction who you are for people who not uh, might not be aware what you what your role was for I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream? Well, I was the uh, I was a producer on I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Uh, I was uh, I joined the project about. Mm, sometime after it started, after the original designer, uh, uh, David Sears, left the project, and uh, I came aboard to uh, complete it, finish it up, and bring it, bring it, to, uh, bring it to the masses. And now, <clears throat> Harlan Ellison has stated in interviews that he's punched out multiple reducers when they went against his wishes. In your experience, what was it like to work with him? Was he really that difficult? Well, when I first met him, it was difficult. I remember I... Uh, my first meeting with him was uh, was at his house in Sherman Oaks, California. I uh, I drove up to his house all by myself, so I had introduced myself, and it was intimidating at first because all around his house was barbed wire, really, all around the the, the roof, uh, with gargoyles, stone gargoyles behind it, and the gargoyles were decoration, and I guess the the barbed wire or it was razor wire to uh, to prevent people from stealing the gargoyles. Uh, so I went up and knocked on the door and my, uh, my childhood hero, my favorite author at the time opened the door and there he was. And he said, who are you? And I said, I'm David Mullock from cyber dreams. Oh, great. Another member of the cyber dreams brain trust. All right, come on in. And, uh, so, uh, I came in, they're changing people on me all the time. So uh, I came in and uh, I said, well, I'm here to show you our progress on the game so far. And I went into his kitchen, set up my computer, or at least attempted to. He said, go plug it in over there. And he pointed to this booth in his kitchen. And it was like a restaurant booth. You know, one of those those booths where it was kind of semicircular bench, uh, you know, padded padded bench with a, t with a table in front of it. Yeah, like said, a 1950s plug it in over there. diner. Right, just mm -hmm. like that. And, and the thing, the thing was, I looked around, I didn't see an electrical outlet, and I'm looking all around, and he started, he started making, making disparaging comments about my IQ. <laughs> then finally, I realized there was a plant sitting on on the headboard or on the on the on the backing behind the planter, and I lifted up the plant, and and there was there was the outlet, but it wasn't upright like this. It was it was face down like this, so. The plan was covering it up, so I, I I I solved that puzzle, plugged in my computer, and then I started to show uh, boot up the the booted up and started showing off our progress on the game, and uh, you know he scowled at first, but then uh, I was looking at the artwork, and then I was explaining to him that uh, uh, I I'd been a I'd been a producer for gosh how long for this point at least like fifteen years by this point. And I told him about one of the first games I worked on was a game based upon the television series, The Prisoner. And that uh, that, that turned out to be a big hit. I was very respectful of the source material. And I, 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 I worked hard to, uh, to uh, bring forth what was good about that television show uh, and, bring, and adapt it properly for the medium of, of, of video games without trying while trying to preserve the literary quality of the show and uh as more i started talking to him about that uh the scowl you know disappeared from his face and he started nodding and i started explaining to him that that this i know math in my screen is my favorite short story of all time and that i wanted to really do justice to it and uh and, and treat it with a lot of respect and i think that's ultimately what he was looking for uh all of Harlan's stories, really, the, all, any story you hear about him um, uh, acting up really comes down to him resisting any attempt to him not being respected or his work not being treated respectfully. And uh, I showed him right away that I did have respect for his work and that I would not botch it up because I, I, I had had a long career uh, before I even started working on the project. And... Ever since that that first meeting, he and I had a terrific time working together. Had no problems with him whatsoever. 
Would you have any advice for someone, like, because you said it was a bit of a turbulent beginning, would you have any advice to someone uh, to maybe help not to, to let things take it to heart, like the insults and such forth? Well, I always try to act professionally, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, I knew about Harlan's history. I mean, I, I had read the stories. I was a big Star Trek fan, and uh, I, uh, I had read all the behind-the-scenes stories about uh, his work on City on the Edge of Forever, and uh, what it was like uh, for, the, for, for, for the Star Trek production team to work with. And I heard a lot of other stories as well, and I had heard him speak at science fiction conventions. Uh, so I, I knew what I was getting into, and uh, uh, they said, they, they say, never meet your heroes, because they'll always disappoint you. Well, he didn't disappoint me in terms of his initial behavior. That's exactly what I expected from him. So I didn't take it personally. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, you know, I try never to take things personally anyway, but uh, he acted exactly as I expected. Uh, so I, 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 I never took the bait. I just proceeded on to do my demonstration. And to uh, even though he initially showed me with disrespect, I only showed respect back. So uh, I guess my advice to uh et, to everyone is treat people like how they want to be uh, treated uh and if at first they they don't treat you the same give it some time uh you can turn people around it it's my it's my job as a producer to handle situations to uh to 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 uh take chaos and turn it into order and part of that is 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 do take control of the situation, and, and that's how I I handled it with him by uh, not uh, by not uh, responding uh, emotionally to anything that he said. What was the hardest day for you during developing I Numa, I Must Scream, or the most difficult aspect of the game to develop? Well, uh, as I said, it was started by another game designer named David Sears, and he had left the project part way through. I I don't know why. Uh, I, I heard that he had accepted another job elsewhere, uh, but uh, that's really all I knew. And he left behind half of a game de design document for the project. And by half a design, I don't mean that he worked, you know, did the first fifty percent of the game and abandoned it. Rather, he started writing the entire game, but so randomly, half of it was taken out or really never done. I mean, half the dialogue, uh, a lot of the puzzles that were. That were a part of the uh, adventure game component to it uh, were never completed. Uh, so it, I, I decided since I had designed the prisoner, uh, that uh, I'd be the best person to complete the design on this. So that was the tough part of it uh, was having to complete the design, and because uh, it was a lot of work. Normally, if, if I'm producing a project, I don't also design it, I, and I was I was also uh, I was also producing another project with H.R. Giger at the same time. So I had a, I had a big workload with me. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I took it upon myself to complete the design. And of course, this game is all about psychological horrors and, and ethical dilemmas. So it's, uh, if in writing, trying to complete the dialogue, I had to place myself in the position of those characters. And I think the toughest part for me was, um, dealing with the uh, character of Ellen, who in her story, she is afraid of the color yellow. And uh, eventually we discover that it's because she was raped by a man wearing yellow. And in her scenario, she has to confront a rapist. And I had to write all that dialogue. And uh, so I, I had to put myself in, in her position. And uh, I, I wrote a lot of that at home in the middle of the night, like like 1, uh, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., right, right in the exchange between her and her rapist. And uh, emotionally, that, that was the toughest part to do. What I find interesting was that you actually wrote a lot of the dialogue for the game. I was always under mm -hmm. the impression that Harlan Ellison like, wrote everything. No, if I broke it down, I'd say probably he wrote 20% of the dialogue. And then maybe David Sears wrote forty percent, and I wrote another forty percent. Oh, game the game dialogue it really flows together nicely. Like you, like I could never tell it was written by you know, like you said, three different people. Yeah, I, I, I was. Uh, that was very fortunate that I, I I wanted everything to flow together, 
and uh, I guess we were, we were lucky enough to make it happen. Is there anything you regret about the game? Anything you wish you could go back and change about it? Not really. I mean, it, 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 uh, there were things that we put in that, that eventually uh, had to be taken out. We, uh, we did have one scenario in it with the character of Benny, who had been turned by the uh, computer AM into this horrific monster. And uh, this, uh, this ape-like creature. And uh, there was one scene where you see a, uh, you see a shadow of him eating a child. Uh, taking a baby out of a crib and, and eating it, and our uh, my my management at Cyber Dreams thought that was that was uh, too intense to uh, uh, to 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 sell, so they had a they had a they had me take it out, and uh, so th there were some things that were removed from it. Uh, I'm not sure I I necessarily disagree with that decision, so I, I can't really say I regret it. There, there's very little I re regret about the game. It, it turned out very well, won all sorts of awards. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, as, as long as other people were happy with it, I'm, I'm happy with it. Do you remember if any, like, like we talked about the, the, uh, infant scene and some other censored, uh, items like the, uh, beagle cutscene in the airship as Gore store. And no, there was something else. Oh yeah. In the freezer on Gore store scenario as well, there used to be bodies hanging from the meat hook instead of cattle. Aside from those scenes, was anything else of significance at all censored in the game? Because I found on the disc, there is an audio file of machine gun fire, and I was wondering if Nimdok was ever originally going to be gunned down instead of just being put into the oven should the player enter a fail state. Not that I remember. I, I, in fact, I don't remember there being, uh, in the, in the Gorister scene, there being any characters other than his wife and mother-in-law i think hanging on the meat hooks um no i i don't remember anything being taken out from it uh while we were developing it other other than that one 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 scene uh in the shadows of of, of benny uh we did I, we did uh discover that uh the uh when uh when our, our European distributors made a French and German versions of the game, they took out the entirety of the Nimdok sequence since he was a, a Nazi doctor in his scenario. And uh, they thought that as a result, they wouldn't sell that well in, uh, in, in, in the countries in which they distributed. And so they, they excised the, uh, that entire scenario. And uh, I, I don't know how they got around it since but you have to play all the scenarios in order to eventually win the game. Uh, I, I don't know how they handled t carving out such a large section. Yeah, for that, for the European releases with the four characters, at the end game, uh, any character can just type in 1945, and it censors it saying it's something about AM's experiments. That's hmm. how are they able to bypass that. All right. I guess they found a way. Yeah. There's also, in preview footage, there are some unused items like a rock, a cleaver, and what appears to be a remote or calculator. Do you recall any of these items that they might have been used for? That's it. Well, I, I vaguely recall those items. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was just a case of, uh, in the original game design document, they were among the list of items, uh, inventory items that were to be implemented. Uh, and I... We created our work for those items, but I, I, I never worked them into this uh, into the game. I see. As for cut content, Harlan Ellison also stated in an interview that Cyber Dreams originally wanted a sequel to I Know My Thing Must Scream. Do you have any comment about that? Uh, let's see, I, I only have I vaguely remember it. I'm sure that we wanted to do a sequel and we may have asked him and uh, he declined. He didn't want there to be a sequel to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's really all I remember. We we probably we, we probably asked, and he said no. And we said okay. Do you have any i any ideas what you would have done for a sequel at all? Never gave it any thought what I'd do for a sequel. I see. In the same vein, whatever happened to the PSX port of IMO Mouth? Was it ever in any stage of development, or is it just quietly canceled? I don't recall there ever being any work done on a PSX. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. How about demos? Did it have uh, more than one playable demo? Uh, I don't recall. I'm sorry. It was it's over 20 years ago, and I uh, I don't remember much about demos for it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we created one, but I I don't recall if we created more than one. Well, thank you for that answer. And yeah, we're actually right now, we're going to play some two trailers here and we'll be back in a jiffy. Gorister, the suicidal loner, is one of the last five members of the human race. Each is the captive of an omnipotent supercomputer named Am, and each is sent into his own private nightmare. Am has given Gorister a chance to escape aboard a giant zeppelin, but will his guilt over his wife's death push him over the edge? Benny is Am's favorite torture toy, starved, mutilated, and crippled a thousand times over. Reduced to an arthritic, hobbling simian, Benny is thrust into a primitive society that has even less compassion for human weakness than he. Ellen was an intelligent and competent engineer, but Am knows what buttons to push to turn her into a screaming hysteric. Am has challenged her to overcome her fears and find his original components. Nimdok believes he deserves the 109 years of torture that Am has been subjecting the five captives to. But Am sees Nimdok as a kindred spirit and is eager for him to continue his past research. Former socialite Ted is the paranoid of the group. Is Lady Ellen prepared? As ready as she will ever be. The spell keeps her body weak, but she will remain conscious. The art of sacrifice is reduced to science. And what of the glamour? We must wait for its removal. It remains beyond our best efforts. Then we wait for a prince. With his help, we can open the gate to the other world. If he can overcome his inner demons, Ted may find an escape to the world above. But if he and the others fail to overcome their fatal flaws, the mad god Am will continue their living hell for the rest of eternity. Cyber Dreams presents I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. <laughs> A maniacal supercomputer was designed to destroy mankind. Why it chose to keep five pathetic parodies of humanity alive in its belly, only to torture them for these 109 years since the apocalypse, is anybody's guess. Believe me, I'd like to know. Maybe because I'm one of the five. It doesn't matter which of us you choose to become. Nimdok, the sadist running from his twisted past. Benny, the deformed and demented man-beast. Ellen. The phobic, mysteriously terrified of the color yellow. Gorister, guilt-ridden, would-be suicide. Or yours truly, Ted, the cynical and paranoid outcast. Only by mastering your own inner demons can you hope to outwit Am. Five lives, each with a vast array of unpredictable outcomes only you can bring about. A word of advice, when the experience gets too intense, just say to yourself, all right, welcome back, everyone. Now that you watched those trailers, uh, do you have any uh, memories of them at all where they might have been used for? I have no memories of either of these trailers. In fact, as I was watching them, I was wondering who supplied the voices for them because uh, I didn't recognize either of the voices. Uh, so I, I, I certainly recognize scenes from the games that, that brought back stronger memories of the game itself. But no, uh, I'm I'm sure they were just trailers that we use that would we would distribute to uh to 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 increase awareness of the games. Probably send them out to our distributors and and other salespeople about the game. But uh, that's 
I don't remember much about them, I'm afraid. That's all good. Now I have one final question for you. Do you have a favorite character scenario? Oh, I think uh, I think my favorite is Gorister. Uh, he's to me uh, the the I I thought the most interesting scenario. Uh, there was a lot of different locations in his story, and uh, I, uh, I I I liked his story uh, that that it was about him overcoming uh, guilt over uh, over uh, uh, having his wife uh, uh, put away. Um, I, I th and also I think it's it's. It was the first scenario I worked on, so probably lavished my the most amount of my attention on that one. So that that's probably my favorite. That was also my favorite scenario as well. I always enjoyed his scenario, just the design. I, of it. I like the yes, I like the Zeppelin. That that was really cool. It also felt like that scenario had. It feels like the most moral choices out of all of them, and different things to do compared to other ones. Probably so. Probably so. It's. Uh, my, my, I, I probably Ted is my least favorite one, and as it turned out, that 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 would have been Harlan's as well. I remember I would occasionally when I uh, when I would I visited Harlan like half a dozen times during the development of the story, and a couple of a uh, couple of times I'd bring over some of the uh, scenarios that I that I had written up, some of the dialogue uh, sequences I had written up, and uh, I remember showing him Ted stuff, and he started reading it and going. No, no, no! This is terrible. This, this is, this is, this isn't what it's supposed to be at all. <laughs> and I said, "Well, I, I based it upon the the, the game the, the game design dr document draft I was given. What is was the st story supposed to be?" And he goes, "I don't remember, but it wasn't this." <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, we we had to go with it because uh, he didn't remember an alternate story for Ted. Uh, so I, I think any of us were, were very happy with the Ted storyline. Yeah, it seems like Ted's storyline, he gets riffed a lot on. I remember mm -hmm. like one, one famous scene was him trying to close the door, him trying to fix the door, it failed, and he's like, oh, that's just super, the door latch is broken. And it's just, it's very, it's just kind of hilarious, and you're in this hell scenario, and this is what's going on during it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, I, I didn't like the environment very much. It was all just very kind of like haunted, haunted housey and, and not, uh, not really very deep to it. Of course, Ted himself was in a deep character, so maybe that's appropriate. Well, thank you very much for your time. Do you have anything else you'd want to say to the people out there, maybe? Oh, well, uh, I, keep uh supporting interactive fiction uh that that's what originally got me interested in developing video games uh when i was in college i started real i took a computer science class and uh i started realizing that uh that computers were uh, as valid a medium for telling stories as was uh as was uh the written word and film and uh and uh and uh, other forms of, of, of storytelling. Uh, so uh, uh, I've, I've always been excited by, by the medium of computers to tell stories that, uh, that players can engage in and help tell themselves to their actions. Uh, so, uh, you know, the adventure game isn't quite as, that, that medium isn't quite as popular as it used to be. Uh, I, I would like to see a more of a resurgence in it. So uh, whenever you do see a, you know, a great adventure game out there that someone's put together or, or any type of interactive story. Uh, yeah, go out. Uh, I encourage you to play it and talk about it. And let's get some more of these stories being made. I, I would love to see actually even more uh, more literary works adapted to a video game format so that we can, uh, uh, so that uh, the, the stories can be shared more and experienced more by other people. Thank you for your thoughts, and uh, yeah, let's wave bye to the camera together. Thank you to the audience out there for watching. We'll see you on the next upload. Farewell. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.